How could I live? How could I live without you? How could I live? How could I live without you, God? You make my world go wrong. <laughs> yes, you do, God. Hallelujah. When it was upside down. Yes, God. Hallelujah, God. Hmm. You make my world go wrong. Yes. Hallelujah. Hmm. When it was upside down. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You make my world go round. Yes, God. When it was upside down. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. You make my world go round. And round it, round it, and round it. We it was upside down. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. And where would I be? Where would I be, God, without you? Mm. How could I live? How could I live without you? Where would I be without you, God? How could I live? 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 How could I live without you? Hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That song is so powerful. Where would we be without him? Where, where would we, how can we live without him? Thank you, Connie, so much for just allowing God to use you in such a powerful and mighty way. And um, we're just going to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to prepare the way uh, for what God wants to say tonight. And so um, I'm going to call forth my precious sister, Denise. She's going to open us up in prayer. Um, Denise, are you on the line? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. <laughs> well, that was a great song, Connie. That was a good reminder of reminding us where we were without Jesus. And that just, thank you, Connie. That really opened up and just made me cry to thanking God for where he has brought me, and I'm excited for where he's going to bring all of us. So um, I just want to open up in Scripture um, with Jeremiah 29, 11, 14 in, in the Message Bible, um, which, you know, we all know this, this message, but if you, if you read in the Message Bible, it's really powerful. It says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. When you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I'll listen. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. God's decree. And when I read it in the Message Bible, it spoke, and one of the things that I loved about this, it says when you get serious, a lot of times we're looking, 
But God just gave me, a lot of times we're looking for him when we want him, but we need to get serious because this is a time we're entering into a new year. And in my spirit, when we're entering into the new year, I just felt the Lord today as I was praying and, and read it, really reading this, that we're going to be worshiping him. We're going to be digging in deeper in a way that we've never dug before. It's going to be different because as we dig in deeper, God is opening new doors. The doors are swinging wide open. So the plans that we might have for ourselves, are not the plans that he has for us and a lot of us right now some some of us you know you get too dependent on a prophet I'm um, giving you a word or someone speaking into your life but the plans that God has for you that he has placed in your heart those things that he has given you visions those things that he's impressed upon you if you just seek him and wait Wait for him as these things start to happen and you start walking into his, digging in his presence, he's going to open those doors and we just have to just trust him because as we're going into deeper levels with him and as, as we're going into new territory that might be different for us, it might seem like we're alone. So I love when he said he will not abandon us because sometimes people are going to be stripped away from us. Our comfort zone is going to be stretched, and God is letting us know that he is not going to abandon us, and that is as we're going into this year and, and, and as, as we're going into our new territory, God is not abandoning you, but not, not abandoning us. So we just have to just really seek him in a different way, and God is just going to do mighty things, and that's something that I, I, I really believe in in my spirit. So um, I would just like to, um, prayer, is that okay, Ann? Yes, no, hello, Ann? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you right now, Father God, for this for this conference call. Lord, I thank you right now for every woman that's on this call, Father God. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that you have handpicked each and every one of us for such a time as this, Father God. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that right now that you're going to do a mighty thing through this call. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I bind the enemy, Father God, that is trying to interfere into this phone call. Father God, I bind everything in the spirit realm, Father God, that the enemy is trying to do, Father God. So right now, in the name of Jesus, Father God, we declare that the airways will be clear, Father God. Father God, I just pray right now that you touch the minds, Father God. We just bind every spirit of distraction, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. And Lord, right now, I just pray, Father God, with the boldness, Father God, that each woman here, Father God, Father God, that we lay everything at your feet, Father God, all our worries, Father God, Father God, all all our concerns, Father God, everything that we have been carrying, Father God, in our hearts, Father God, it is a new year, Father God. We lay everything at your feet, Father God. Father God, we will trust you, Father God. Father God, I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God, Father God, that each of us here, Father God, you have put us here together, Father God, because the Holy Spirit is here, and you have a word for each and every one of us, Father God. So I pray right now, Father God, that you will open the eyes of our hearts, Father God, Father God, that we will receive with our hearts, Father God, not our minds, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God, for your will will be done, Father God. Right now, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, I declare, Father God, clarity of our minds, Father God, clarity of our thoughts, Father God, clarity of our wills and our, and our, and our spirit, Father God. So right now, right now, in the name of Jesus, Father God, we know that your presence goes before us. Your presence is here, Father God, and we thank you, Father God. We thank you for what you're going to do in each and every one of us, Father God. I just pray, Father God, a boldness over each and every one of us, Father God. A boldness to do your will, Father God, even if we have to walk by ourselves, Father God, but we know that you do not abandon us, Father God, and we know that you have equipped us for such a time as this, Father God. I pray right now, Father God, that you have given us new strategy, Father God. Father God, I thank you right now for the women, for the people that you have placed in our lives, Father God, to help us, Father God, as we come and we enter into the new path that you have given us, Father God. Father God, I just pray right now, Father God, that you would just, I pray for wisdom, wisdom, Father God 
that we need, Father God, for decisions that we have to make, Father God. I pray for discernment, Father God, that we will not be tickled, Father God, by people, Father God, giving us what we want to hear, Father God, but we will discern the spirit. We will test every spirit to make sure it's of you, Father God. Father God, right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God, I just pray right now, Lord Jesus, that you will give us, Father God, the boldness, Father God, to walk in the different territories, Father God, that you are broadening our steps in, Father God, and we thank you for we walk by faith and not by sight, Father God. I pray right now that everyone listening to Father God, that we will dig deeper in your word, Father God. Father God, that we will chew on your word, Father God, day and night, Father God. Father God, that we are your sheep and we hear your voice, Father God. So we thank you, Father God, for what you have in store for us. We thank you for this conference, Father God. And right now, I pray over our sister and Father God. Father God, that you have anointed her for such a time as this, Father God, that you have placed this on her heart, Father God. And Father God, we know that she would do your will, Father God. She is your vessel, Father God. She is an obedient vessel, a faithful vessel, and she's your, your servant, Father God. So we just pray over her, and we just declare and decree that she will speak, Father God, those words, Father God, and each word, Father God, will fall on fertile ground, Father God. So we thank you as we receive your word word today in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Father God. We glorify your name when we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, sister. Thank you for letting the Holy Spirit use you. What a powerful, powerful prayer. Thank you so much. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, are y'all ready to hear what thus saith the Lord? I have been praying about, you know, what exactly God would have me to share tonight. And, you know, we've been going back and forth in, in, uh, on Facebook as I've been, you know, saying to you all that, you know, this is the year of faith. You know, this is the year where we have to not walk by what we see. We have to not walk by what we can hear, you know, by what we can touch. We have to be able to walk by faith, not by sight. And walking by faith is not easy. Trust me, I know, because right now I am walking a faith walk. And so tonight I want to share with you, um, you know, a, a story that does incorporate someone who has faith or, you know, is known for their faith, but at a time that they did not exercise faith and what the repercussions of not exercising their faith uh, brought upon them. So if you have your Bibles with you or, um, you know, your smartphones or whatever, or you're on your phone, but you still might be able to look at it, um, turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. That's Genesis chapter 16. And I am going to be reading out of the New Living Translation, Genesis chapter 16. And I'm going to begin in verse 1, Genesis 16, verse 1. And it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can give, perhaps I can have children through her. And Abraham agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. Heavenly Father, we just thank you right now for being with us tonight. We thank you for the word, God. Father, I just pray that you will just decrease me, God, and Holy Spirit, that you will increase because we only want to hear from you. You know every person that is on this line tonight. You know their individual situations. You know their struggles. You know their purpose. You know their promises. And so, therefore, we want to hear from you. So, Father, we just we thank you for this opportunity tonight. We say, Holy Spirit, you have your way, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. And we just say amen, amen, and amen. 
So, you know, most of us are familiar with the story of Abraham or Abram because of his great faith. And he's been coined or referred to as the father of faith. And basically, God made a promise with Abram. Um, and before God could fulfill the promise, Abram and his wife, Sarai, tried to fulfill God's promise in their own power. And so as a result of that, they gave birth uh, through a servant named Hagar uh, to a son by the name of Ishmael. Now, you know, as we just read, you know, he and his wife, well, really his wife, she came up with a bright idea to give God a hand. She was like, hey, you know, I'm not getting any younger. Um, you know, we need to help God out here because, um, you know, I'm kind of tired of waiting. And even though Abram knew what God spoke to him earlier, he went ahead and he agreed. You know, the Bible doesn't say he put up a fight. The Bible didn't, he say, the Bible didn't say he said, oh, wait a minute, I can't do that. It just simply said, and he did what she asked them to do. And as a result of them trying to obtain their blessing prematurely, there was a lot of pain that was caused, a lot of division, heartbreak resulted. Because if we read further, and we're not going to go into that tonight, but when Hagar became pregnant, you know, she and Sarah, Sarah became enemies. They started arguing and carrying on, and there was old Abram sitting in the middle of all of it, you know, trying to look like a victim, but he was a big enough part of it just like his wife was. So there was a lot of contention in the house. And from this experience, that's where we get that phrase, you know, don't create an Ishmael. Now, many of you may be familiar with Abraham's story, but for those of you who aren't, let me just share a little bit with you. When Abraham or Abram was 75 years old, God told him to take his family and leave everything that was familiar. I'm talking about everything. He told him to leave his country. He said leave his people, leave his father's family, and go into a land that God said, I will show you. So in other words, he told him, get up, take everything, and just get on the road. You know, that's like, you know, that's like one of us just saying, you know, God told me to, to go to uh, another state. Um, okay, what state? Uh, I don't know. Well, um, did he kind of give you an idea? Not really. He just said go. And it's like putting gas in your car, putting all your belongings in the car, and just getting into the car and going and allowing the Holy Spirit to be your GPS. And basically that is what Abraham and, Abraham and Sarah did. They got up and they left and they did what God told them to do. Because God said that I'm going to uh, make you a great nation. Now, a couple of things here. He was 75 years old when God told him to uproot. You know, when God stepped in and told him to make that move, God was getting ready to do something radical. You know, a move that I'm sure his family and his friends that he had to leave behind, they didn't understand. They probably wanted to know why God didn't just make him a great nation right where he was. Some of them probably thought that he lost his mind. You know, they're like, oh, man, he's getting old. He must be getting dementia or something. Some of them probably wrote him off. Um, some of them probably said, yeah, he'll be back. And I'm sure a lot of them talked about him. You know, for some of you, you've lived close to a full life already. And when I say a full life, if you're in your, you know, your late 30s, your 40s, your 50s, or your 60s, you know, you've done some things. You've been some places. You've seen some things. And now here go God telling you to do something radical, something you've never done before, something a lot of people around you have never done before. He's calling you to make a move. For some of you, it might be a physical move. For some of you, it's a move from your, your current church. Some of you, it's a move from the job that you've been on forever and you've grown comfortable in. But it's a, it's a move that is, is going to take you out of your comfort zone. Some of you, he's calling you to separate yourself from a certain group of friends or a certain friend. He's calling you to separate from your family members who don't understand the call on your life anyway. These people and things that your identity has been rooted in for way too long. And God is ready to, to birth the promise in you, and he needs to have you in a place where you cannot rely upon anything or anybody but him. 
But some of you, because of your age, because you've been divorced, maybe you lost your home, you know, you might even be searching for a job. You're a single mother. You're struggling, and God is showing you, telling you this, but you, because of your looking at your own personal limitations, you're struggling to be obedient to what God is telling you to do. So I just want to encourage you that if God is telling you that it's time to make a move, you must listen because remaining where you are could potentially abort what God is trying to birth through you. Let me say that again. If you remain where you are, where it is comfortable, where it is familiar, where your identity is, is inappropri inappropriately rooted, you could potentially abort what God is trying to birth in and through you. The other thing is that God said that he would make Abram a great nation. You know, making him a great nation would mean that he would have descendants. And at this point, Abram was 75 years old, Sarai was 65 years old, and in the natural, it would seem like they're beyond childbearing years. But how many of you know that, you know, what seems impossible for man is possible with God? You know, God has, God, has, God has spoken a promise to many of you that is bigger, it is, it is wilder than anything your imagination can comprehend. And because you are so busy and stuck looking at it in the natural, you're not able to receive what God is doing. You're, you're walking by sight rather than walking by faith, and you're struggling with receiving, embracing, and claiming the promise that God has spoken over you. But we need to come to a place, you know, sisters and brothers, where we, we, we embrace what God has said. We come to a place where we said, if God said, says it, that settles it. He is able to accomplish exactly what he says he's going to do. But the question is, is will we cooperate? So by faith, Abraham leaves the familiar and the comfortable place. And a couple of chapters later in Genesis 15, God comes right out and he actually tells Abram. He says, look up in the sky. And he says, count the stars if you can. And as many stars as you can see are the number of descendants that I'm going to give you. Now, we don't know the exact age that Abram is right here because I searched and tried to find out. But I can say he's got to be somewhere in his late 70s or early 80s because we know when God told him to leave, he was 75 years old. And then when he had Ishmael, he was 86 years old. So we can safely say that somewhere between the promise and then when Sarah got the bright idea to help God out, we're looking at about 10 years. Now, to be honest, 10 years that's a while, right? I mean, some of you, I don't know how long you've been waiting for God to fulfill the promise, but, you know, that's a long time to have a seed planted in the soil of your heart and then be waiting for it to bloom. I mean, it does make you begin to question some things. It makes you begin to question yourself. It makes you begin to question God because, you know, remember how exciting you were when God spoke that promise to you? You believed it by faith. You grabbed onto it just like Abram. You received it um, just like Abram. You said, yes, this is possible. I, I know what God is doing. God spoke it, and you said, okay. You stepped out of the boat, some of you, and here it is nine, ten years later. You're still in the water. You're in the deep, and there's no sign of a shoreline. The waves are crashing around you, and you're doing all you can to ignore them. You're, you're trying not to let your emotions rule, but you're starting to question some things. You're, you're starting to say, man, did I really hear God right? Um, did I do something to cause God to change his mind? You know, God, you told me to step out of the boat, but I didn't expect that it was going to take that long before you'd come and rescue me. You told me to leave my full-time job, God, and start a business, but here I am. I'm still living paycheck to paycheck. Did I hear you wrong? You told me that you would restore my marriage, God, but my husband is now seeing somebody else. He's moved out. How can I believe your promise, God, when it seems like things have actually gotten worse than better? You know, in those circumstances, anybody would be tempted to take matters into their own hands. I mean, are you tempted right now? How long have you been waiting? And are you tempted to make things happen? Because Abram and Sarai did. They were tempted and they took matters into their own hands. 
Sarai says, hey, I'm not getting any younger. I'm in my 70s, you know, and I, I, God still hasn't given me a child. So, yeah, it's time for us to make some moves. And I believe there's some of you on the line right now that you've been struggling with making a move. But this is why God sent, set up this call tonight, because I want to tell you, slow your roll. You know, a lot of times we hear the term creating an Ishmael, you know, particularly dealing when it comes to relationships. You know, women, you know, we're talking about we're waiting for our Boaz. You know, men, you're talking about you're waiting for your root. And after so many years have passed and you begin to wonder, did, you know, did God forget about me? Everyone around you is all booed up. Every time you log into Facebook, somebody's posting a selfie with their man or with their woman. People are getting married left and right, you know, shacking up. And you're trying to obey God. You're trying to do everything that God called you to do. But yet, it seems like God has forgotten. And so sometimes we create an Ishmael because we, we get discouraged and we get tired of waiting for God. We entertain, ladies and gentlemen, a relationship that looks almost like what God promised. And you can always spot an Ishmael, an Ishmael situation, because it will look very much like the promise, but it will always come with an element of compromise. I'm going to say that again. You can identify an Ishmael because it will look like the promise, but it will carry an element of compromise. It will always require you to settle for less. James chapter 117 says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So that means God don't make no mistakes. He doesn't give us half of a promise. When it's God, it's perfect. It may not be perfect for everybody else, but it is perfect for you. So, sisters, when I hear you say things like, you know, he's tall, good-looking, drive a nice car, got a really good job, but he just don't like to pray, but red flag, because here's the deal. Do you like to pray? Do you have a passion for God? Are you hungry for the word? Do you, you know, are, are you, do you like your prayer time? Do you guard your prayer time? Then why in the world would God give you a husband who doesn't have that same passion and hunger? Not going to happen. That's an Ishmael. You know, sometimes we say, you know, this job is really good. Man, it pays more money than I, you know, than I could ever imagine. And yeah, it's an hour from home, but it's worth the commute. But is it from God? Because when you pray to God and you told him that you wanted a job that would allow you to be closer to home so you can pick up your kids from practice so other people don't have to be picking them up and dropping them off, you can be there to do homework with them and be more available for your kids or your family and then in drop this job with all this money attached to it, you got to ask yourself, is that God? Is that your promise or is that a counterfeit? You know, God told you this is your year to become debt-free, but you know how they do the car dealerships at the beginning of the year. Oh, we can get you into a brand-new car for $99 or $299 or whatever, and the car dealership contacts you. You go, they make a deal you can't pass up. God told you you're going to be debt-free, but you drive off a lot, and now you've got a car payment you're settled you're, uh, saddled in for the next three years, and you're driving around accumulating debt, and you, don't, you, you cannot say that's God because that's anti the promise that he spoke to you. Now, I'm not saying that there might not be times where we may have to start out one place to get to where God is taking us, but we should never settle there. We should never accept it as the promise. Whether it's a job, a relationship, a car, a church, going back to school, we can create Ishmael's of all kinds. We can tend to get ahead of God. See, when we pull an Ishmael family, we are basically trying to fulfill God's promise in our power. Ishmael's come about because we're trying to do what God says he's going to do, our way, our timing. So now that we kind of understand the whole thing about creating an Ishmael, for this last part of, of what I want to share with you, I actually want to talk to you about what to do after 
you've created an Ishmael because there's a lot of preaching and teaching that talks about avoiding creating the Ishmael. But how many of you know sometimes by the time we hear that preaching, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, man, I wish I would have heard that five years ago. I wish I would have heard that two years ago. I wish I would have heard that last month before I let this man move in with me or whatever. So there are times that we hear the message and it appears the message is too late, but God is never late. He's always on time. So tonight, I want to say to you, it is time to get past your Ishmael. If you are on the line and you know what I'm talking about, say that to yourself. It is time to get past my Ishmael. I'm going to give you time to say it. Somebody needs to say it. It is time to get past my Ishmael. Before I say another thing, I want to just take 30 seconds. I'm just going to be quiet for 30 seconds because I want you to think about if you have potentially created any Ishmael in the year of 2015. You know in your heart it was a counterfeit. You, you, you know, you need to get real with yourself and you need to get real with God. You need to lay down any pride. We can't play victims anymore because if we made the decision, the decision has been made and we've got to own it, right? But the thing is, is that we cannot, we cannot uh, until we own it, we can't give it to God. And we will not give God what we're not willing to acknowledge or admit. We are now in 2016, and for many of us, we've got to get past our Ishmael, and we've got to get back on track. So just the next 30 seconds, think to yourself, say, Holy Spirit, show me. Some of you already know. Show me if I have created an Ishmael. Because I need to know, God, your promise still remains. Show me, God. Thank you, Father. Holy, thank you, Holy Spirit. And thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're revealing even right now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Okay, so some of you, you have your, your Ishmael in mind. So here's what I want to tell you. Your Ishmael does not cancel out your Isaac. I'm going to say that again. And for some of you, that ought to be shouting you. That ought to be dancing. You ought to be up on your feet thanking God, you know, running around your house, whatever you need to do. I said that your Ishmael does not cancel out your Isaac. It's not too late. And that's what God sent me tonight to tell you that it is time to get back on track to receive your Isaac. Isaac is the actual promised son, the descendant of Abram, because he was born at God's appointed time, and he was conceived through Abraham and Sarah. And, you know, here's the interesting thing. God actually changed both of their names. They started off as Abram and Sarai, and they, he changed their names to Abraham and Sarah. Now, here's the last scripture that I, I, I want us to look at. If, again, if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 17. That's Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17. And I'm actually going to switch my uh, translations because this one, I believe, really hones in on, on how I really think the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us tonight. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, and I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified, and we see that here it is, God is talking to Abram again years later. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk habitually before me with integrity, knowing that you are always in my presence. And be blameless and complete in obedience to me. And I will establish my covenant, that's my everlasting promise, between me and you. It's interesting that God comes back to Abram and he says to him, okay, are you ready to reset? You actually get a redo. How many years later? You're about to get a redo. I don't care how long it's been. God says, I'm about to establish this thing. He said, are you ready? Yes, you tried it your way. Sister, brother that's on the line, yes, you tried it your way. Yes, you may have created an Ishmael. Yes, you may have stepped out of the will of God. But God told me to tell you tonight that the promise still remains. 
God says he will establish his covenant. You know, the word establish means the following. It means to make firm or stable. It means to put someone or something into a position. Glory to God. It also means to cause, check this one out, to cause someone or something to be widely known and accepted. You know why that one is important? Because there are times that when we create Ishmael, everybody sees our mess up. Everybody talks about it. They know we stepped out of the will of God. Everybody saw your Ishmael. But God says, I'm going to establish, I'm going to cause something to be widely known and accepted. In other words, when I establish my covenant in you, I'm going to cause my promise to come to pass in such a way that everybody will know. Glory be to God. Some of y'all, you know, people have been talking about you. They have rejected you because of your Ishmael. But I got news for you. Your Isaac is on the way. So you don't have to feel ashamed about your Ishmael. You don't have to explain your Ishmael to anybody. They don't have to get it. This is between you and God. But here it is in this scripture we read, God has a requirement, y'all. He says in order to establish the covenant, here's what God says. He says to Abram, you have to habitually walk with integrity, knowing I am always with you, knowing you're always in my presence. In other words, just because other people don't see what we're doing doesn't make it all right. God is always with us. He sees everything. He wants us to walk and live a life of integrity, whether others are looking or not. Whether your pastor knows that you're shacking or not, God knows. Whether your pastor knows you're having sex outside of marriage or not, God knows. And this is what God is saying. He said, I need you. I need you to walk in integrity. I need you to, to conduct yourself as if everything you do, I am right there with you. So for some of us, if we say we're going to be celibate, if we say we're not going to sleep with anybody, come on now. Some of you know I'm talking to you. You know, if you say, if, you know, I'm just going to say it. If you're having an inappropriate relationship outside of your marriage, it doesn't even have to be sexual. It could be emotional. There are such things as emotional affairs. If you are doing these things, God said, I see you. And in order for me to establish my covenant, my promise, you've got to get rid of that Ishmael. God knows. God says, walk with integrity, knowing you're in my presence. Be blameless and complete in obedience. God didn't say be perfect. None of us can ever be completely without sin. But he does mean that when we recognize that we are sinning, quickly repent, shut it down, turn it off, let it go, and get back to being obedient. And then God says, I will establish the covenant. When we jump down to verse 5, here's what God says. He says, no longer your name will your name be Abram, exalted father. He says, but your name shall be Abraham, father of a multitude, for I will make you the father of many nations. He changes his name. Then in verse 15, he says to Abram, Abraham, he says, and as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, which is my princess. But her name will be Sarah. I will bless her, and indeed, I will also give you a son by her. Yes, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Kings of people will come from you, brother and sister, when you decide that you're going to walk in obedience so God can establish his covenant. So, wow. You know, not only does God say he's going to establish his covenant, but he changes their name. Whenever God is about to do something great in us, family, he changes. He often changes our name. And in this year, 2016, some of us need to accept a new name. There are names that others have called you and you've answered to that you will no longer answer to. There's some of you that there are names that you called yourself that you will no longer answer to. Some of you, you've answered to stupid, incompetent, fat, skinny, too light, too dark, weird, crazy, uneducated, mess up, screw up, 
unplanned child, mistake, rejected, broke, barren, divorcee, single mom, which makes you which makes you seem like you're incompetent. That's not that's a lie from the pit of hell. Adulterer, mistress, chick on the side, fornicator. Those things that you used to answer to, you no longer answer to in Jesus' name. God is changing your name, sister. God is changing your name, brother. And then once he changes that name, he is establishing his covenant. Now, here's the interesting thing. In verse 17, it says that Abram fell on his face and he laughed. He laughed. You know, we know about Sarah laughing, but I was like, wow, Abraham laughed too. It says he fell on his face and he laughed and he said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And then Abram said to God, Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael, my firstborn, might live before you. But God said, no, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son indeed, and you shall name him Isaac which means laughter, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Some of you are laughing in your heart, and you are saying, but God, I thought it was too late for me. And God is telling you tonight, as long as you are alive, it is never too late. I know some of you are thinking, but what about my Ishmael situation? What about, what about this, this thing I'm in? Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael, my firstborn, will live for you, will live before you. In other words, Abraham wanted to know if God could somehow make Ishmael a right situation. You know, if we could just work Ishmael into the plan. But hear what God said. He said, no. He said, I'm giving you the promise which is Isaac, not the counterfeit, which is Ishmael. I'm giving you Isaac, whose name means laughter. In other words, you laughed thinking I couldn't do it through you. <laughs> but now you're going to laugh realizing I didn't want to do it without you. <laughs> I'm just saying tonight you need to get this in your spirit. God wants you to laugh and realize how ridiculous you were to doubt him. He wants you to laugh and go, man, I must have been crazy to think that God would not fulfill what he said he's going to fulfill. Tonight, if you are on the line and you know that God has been pulling at you to give up that Ishmael, to just repent before him, to be obedient, to, to finally let it go, you know, the Ishmael could even be a place that you've settled in, you've gotten comfortable in, and you thought that was God's best for you, but it wasn't. And God is saying to you tonight, I am ready to establish my promise in you. You know, the, the root name of Ishmael is derived from the Hebrew verb shama, and shama means to hear. And so the name Ishmael means God has heard. Brother, sister that's on the line tonight, God has heard your cry. And he's here tonight. And he wants you to know he's heard your cry. And he wants to know, are you willing to give him your Ishmael? Will you trust him again? Will you walk by faith? and not by your sight or your emotions? Will you walk obedient? Will you walk with integrity before him so that he can change your name spiritually and establish his promise in you this year? This is the year. I'm telling you, 2016, this is the year. So as we close, I, I, I just, you know, I, I, I want to ask you, you know, will you believe God again? Yes, I know it, it's been hard, but God has an Isaac ready to replace your Ishmael. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight and first and foremost, we repent, God. 
We repent, God, for taking matters into our own hands. And even if we haven't yet, God, we, we repent of even being tempted to do it, God. We repent of doubting how faithful you are, God. Father, we just, we just confess before you tonight that we need you. We need you to help us get back on track, refocus, strengthen our resolve, because we claim that 2016, that 2016 is that year where we will see the promises fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is asking, will you, will you allow, will you allow me to make any mistakes that you've made, will you allow me to make it right? He's asking, will you, will you allow me to, to turn your Ishmael back into an Isaac? Holy Spirit, we just, we just, we thank you for everything that you've done and said on this call tonight. You know, we thank you. We, you know, I, I believe that I have said what you've, you've called me and, and, and called me to say, um, and that your word went forward and that a life was changed as a result. Right now, I just pray for supernatural obedience over every person on this line. I pray that they will walk in integrity. I pray that we will encourage each other to do what thus saith the Lord and not what we think others should do. Because as we see, Sarai encouraged her husband in the other direction from what God wanted. And Eve didn't influence Adam in the direction God instructed him either. And we don't want to be that in each other's lives, and nor do we want to have those people in our lives either. So, Father, give us wisdom about the relationship that you would have us be assigned to this year, not attached to. People that attach is because they want something. But when someone is assigned, it's because they're going to impart. They're going to give something. So, Father, remove any person from each of our lives who are not assigned to our purpose and destiny. And we will wait, even if it means being in isolation for a period of time, we will wait until the right person right resources, right provisions uh, are, are given to us in your timing. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for tonight. I thank you for our grow family, God. You know, as we continue to grow in you, God, let us, let us boldly proclaim your name and let us be humble enough to let you truly rule our world. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, we just thank you, God, and we just bless you tonight. And we just say amen and amen and amen.